A convention center full of people who have gathered to talk about the ketogenic diet? Who on earth would go to such a thing? This girl, of course, and my mom too. I've just returned from KetoCon 2023 in beautiful Austin, Texas, and I'm here to give you my report on what I learned, what surprised me, what I'm still not sure about, and why I'm more motivated than ever to continue doing what I do. So, hey! This is Julie from Julie Sad Wellness. I'm an ADHD coach that helps women get focused, fit, and have fun again through mindset coaching, a few ADHD hacks, and the use of a therapeutic-grade ketogenic diet. Happy to have you here. Subscribe if you haven't already, yeah? So KetoCon was amazing. My mom and I had so much fun, met so many cool people, and learned a lot. I'm here today to give you some of the highlights from our time at this three-day event. If you want to check out any of the people or things I mentioned today, take a look at the description for a link to the related blog post. It's all there. Okay, first off, I was surprised by just how many people at the conference were full-on carnivores. Out in the so-called real world, even though I believe in the power of the ketogenic diet with everything I got, I'm still the only one in my circle of friends who's on it, except for my mom and a couple of my cousins, and they're all doing great on it, by the way. Yippee! Anyways, the point is, when I'm out and about, compared to others, I feel like I'm on a pretty strict diet. But then, I go to KetoCon, and compared to the majority of the speakers, who are total carnivores, my diet seems pretty chill. Funny how that works. So, am I converting to carnivore after hearing so many carnivore speakers? Well, not yet. For the moment, I'm happy where I am, which is something pretty close to ketovore, kind of in the middle of keto and carnivore. If a client of mine wants to do carnivore, I advise them to up the fat content, at least in the beginning, so we hit more of that therapeutic grade keto macro ratio, simply because we have more data on the effectiveness of that. So let's do what we know is most likely to work first. Meanwhile, I have found that broccoli just doesn't jive with me, so that's one thing that's definitely off my list, and the carnivores would agree with me on that one. More on broccoli later. So my conclusion on whether I personally want to be keto or ketovore or carnivore is that I haven't reached a conclusion just yet. Further investigation is needed, so stay tuned. All right, so let's talk about some of the speakers at KetoCon. The one that I was most looking forward to seeing was Dr. Ken Berry. I'm a huge fan of his and even got to take a selfie with him and try to hide how nervous I was meeting him because he really is one of my idols. He did something in his talk that I think was really brave. Since KetoCon is a conference, there are speakers and there are lots of vendors. Some of them sell keto energy bars, exogenous ketones, weird massage devices that actually make you feel more tense, ask me how I know, and so on. Dr. Barry talked about how 90% of the stuff being peddled there at the conference was useless crap. The crowd applauded wildly. I love that he said that. In order to do a ketogenic diet, you really don't need to buy very much except for delicious food and maybe a mineral supplement or two. Dr. Barry talked about our ancestral past and how we used to eat these big, huge mammals, think woolly mammoth. This was kind of an aha moment for me because I had always been taught that the reason keto works is because it mimics fasting. Could it be that keto also works because it mimics the way we used to eat? Lots of fatty meat from these elephant-like animals? Something to think about, and if you have any thoughts on this, please let me know. I love this stuff. Dr. Barry also talked about broccoli being a human invention. This blew my mind, big time. And of course, I had to give it a Google later. And he's right. According to the Goog, broccoli was invented in the 6th century BC through selective breeding. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? We're always told that it's such a healthy food, but it wasn't even something our ancestors ate. All I know is that after cutting it out of my diet, I don't miss my broccoli farts of yore. (laughs) Those were pretty deadly. And speaking of farts, the good doctor also talked about how some people cannot tolerate fiber at all and have an immediate adverse reaction to it. Some people tolerate it fine, and then the majority of us are somewhere in the middle in that fiber somewhat slowly takes a toll on us. I know that hearing this will shock a lot of people. Don't we need so much fiber? When you really sit down with the research, it would appear that 
we don't need it. (laughs) There are other animals that can take fiber and process it and use it. Humans, not so much. Other speakers echoed this sentiment as well, and I will echo it too. I used to be the queen of fiber, but now I'm over it. I barely consume any fiber at all now, and I feel great, and the bathroom situation is just fine. Thank you very much. (laughs) Anyways, all in all, it was a very cool lecture by Dr. Barry that made me think about ancestral man and if there are any parts of my life that I could maybe decomplicate a bit, because at the end of the day, as Dr. Barry says, Our ancestors did spend a lot of time just kind of lying around and gossiping. So maybe this idea that we have to be hyper-productive always on robot-like humans, go, 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 is a dumb one. (laughs) Next up, I want to talk about Dr. Sean Baker. Wow, he is a really interesting guy. He's best known for coining the term the carnivore diet. Back in the day, it used to be called the zero-carb diet because it's, well, zero carbs. (laughs) He's one of those who really practices what he preaches and has been on an all-meat diet for seven years now. When you see him in person, to be honest, it's intimidating. The man is really tall and appears to be pure muscle and lots of it. He could probably lift a car with one hand. I'm not even joking. He looks about 25 years younger than his biological age to boot. When you hear him speak, though, it's clear that he's much more than just a well-chiseled specimen of athletic excellence. He really knows his stuff, and what I like about him most is that he never makes any recommendations without backing him up with data. So, for example, one thing that we always hear is that you have to get grass-fed, grass-finished meat, that you have to eat organic meat only, and that if you're carnivore, you need to eat organ meat to get all your vitamins. Guess what? (laughs) Good news. Dr. Baker said, and this is after looking at the actual research, don't worry about the grass-fed stuff, don't worry about organic meat, and don't worry about organ meat. There really was nothing in the data he examined to say that there was any real benefit to be had by following these rules we always hear. Again, these recommendations come from him looking at actual data. However, He says some people have reported that they feel better when eating organic meat or grass-fed beef or organ meats, so that's something to keep in mind. If that's your personal experience and you feel better eating grass-fed, grass-finished beef, for example, then yeah, by all means, stick with it. I don't need to tell you that. I'm lucky because I live in Colombia where all our beef is grass-fed, grass-finished, so I don't have to deal with that decision. I am, however, very happy to hear that the organ meats thing is not so important as two weeks ago, I tried making a beef liver pate and it wasn't so great and was actually the only time my husband has flat out said that something I've cooked was horrible. (laughs) Usually he really likes my food and even told me that that's why he married me. So romantic. Meanwhile, here's something else interesting that Dr. Baker said. A lot of times when we talk about nutrition, it's important to keep bioavailability in mind. Now, I'm not so much of an expert in this that I can run around quoting percentages and milligrams of this and that and so on, but my general understanding is that the nutrients in meat are much more bioavailable than the nutrients in vegetables, in a human diet, that is. This means that that kale that you thought was so great because it had so many vitamins in it might not actually be delivering on its promise. So... Guess what Dr. Baker said was one of the foods with some of the highest nutrient bioavailability. Just guess. Bologna. No, really, he said bologna. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I hear this stuff, I really have to breathe and realize that so much of what I thought to be true really wasn't. I challenge you to find another website that says that bologna is a health food. Crazy stuff. Come to think of it, I haven't had bologna since I was a kid and I used to really love it. I'm going to see if I can find some here at the grocery store. Yum. So thank you, Dr. Baker. Super interesting talk, and I'm now your newest fan. There were also several speakers who talked about the environmental impacts of a meat-based diet, including a regenerative farming panel, which unfortunately I didn't attend because I was in another lecture. But I'm going to see if I can get the recordings and um, check it out because I think it's super interesting. Now, the environmental argument against meat is something we've all heard. I'm not going to go into it too much today because I really want to sit down with the data and give you guys some good, solid information. 
That said, here are a few tidbits. Did you know that for every pound of beef produced, 3.5 pounds of carbon are sequestered into the soil and the farm's plants? I heard this at the Keto Mojo lecture. More on that one in a bit. Again, without going into a ton of stats here, if you really look at the numbers, livestock farming can actually be regenerative. These numbers, you always hear about how much water is needed to make a pound of beef. Well, they came up with those numbers by measuring the amount of rain that fell on the grass that the cows ate. It was rainwater that would have fallen anyways, not processed drinking water that you or I would have from our tap. And I do believe the cows pee and breathe most of it back out, don't you? They're not like permanently destroying water molecules. Long story short, we're not going to save the planet by going vegetarian, okay? More on that in future episodes as I learn more and get you some better quotable numbers. Another lecture I attended was by Dorian Greenow, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I did a super Google on it and couldn't figure it out. Um, and he is the co-founder of Keto Mojo. The topic was to track or not to track your ketones. Well, this was interesting as the general attitude from the carnivore folks was that they didn't bother with tracking, whereas many of the other speakers had nothing but positives to say about it. Keto Mojo is a company that makes blood glucose and ketone meters. I've wanted one forever and I finally bought one at the conference and I give it a thumbs up. I've also used a random ketone breath meter that I bought for like 19 bucks on Amazon that didn't work really well and the pee strips and the pee strips seem to work all right but if you want an actual number instead of just a color then you won't like them and you'll hear all sorts of opinions on whether or not to track your ketones i really think it's up to you if it'll help motivate you or help you understand your body better then why not it can definitely be a useful tool if you don't feel like spending the money on a device or urine strips or fussing with all the measurements then maybe don't add another thing to your to-do list that said, I also attended a lecture by Dr. Annette Bosworth, aka Dr. Boz, who talked about tracking. She used ketone meters in a group program she ran and said that she really felt that it made a difference. The group members just seemed to be more motivated from getting that instant feedback. And Dr. Boz says she saw improvement that was even more rapid than what she usually sees. Okay, moving on, the thyroid was mentioned a lot. Wow. The thyroid is a complicated and very important topic, but I'll just give you my two biggest takeaways from the information I heard about thyroid function. These are from the lecture I attended by Temple Stewart, AKA the ketogenic nutritionist. She's a registered dietitian who's also in training to become a doctor. Super cool. For thyroid function, a low carb ketogenic or carnivore diet are all good ideas is what she said. I will add my own two cents here and say that, Hey, watch it with the so-called low carb diets. Some of them are not very low carb at all. If you're doing low carb, but you're still getting like 30% of your daily calories from carbs, um, maybe reevaluate that if you're not getting the results you want. Okay. Also in Temple Stewart's lecture and in others, I heard a lot about fluoride being not so great for thyroid function. So it's best to filter your tap water. I learned so much information and have decided to devote much more time to deepening my understanding of the thyroid as its function is such an important part of our overall health. Now, next up, let's talk about menopause. Dr. Elizabeth Bright is the author of the book, Good Fat is Good for Women, Menopause, and she had some fascinating insights on the subject. For one thing, she claimed that perimenopause doesn't exist. <gasps> There were audible gasps in the audience when she dropped that bomb. She went on to clarify and say that, yes, there are symptoms that many women have in the years leading up to menopause, but that they're caused by the adrenals trying to take over. And therefore the solution is to fix the adrenals. This is of course a huge and complex topic. So I would refer you to her website to see what else she has to say about this and come to your own conclusions as she says a lot of things that go against the current standard guidelines. My kind of gal. Now, of course, I'm not going to finish this episode without talking about what I ate. Since KetoCon was in Austin, Texas, you can imagine all of the delicious stuff I chowed down on. One night, my mom and I went to a barbecue that was presented as part of the conference. The chefs at the barbecue were shocked that 
the group went through 12 entire briskets. They actually ran out of brisket and they had trouble keeping the meat coming out fast enough. I don't think they had ever seen a group of people eat that much meat. It was delicious though. The event was at a place called the Sapien Center, a new kind of social club that looks really interesting. Um, and the barbecue was provided by a company called Pop Smoke. Yum and yum. When we were in line to go back for seconds at the barbecue, my mom and I met a really cool guy named Casey Ruff, who, along with his wife Bethany, has a fantastic podcast called Boundless Body Radio, where they interview many of the thought leaders in the keto carnivore space. He is also carnivore. Man, is everyone carnivore? Did I just not get the memo? On his podcast, he has interviews with two of my heroes in the metabolic psychiatry world, Dr. Chris Palmer and Nicole Laurent. So of course I was majorly in awe of him for that, but I also enjoyed hearing his personal story about how much better he felt when he made a drastic change to the way he ate. And that was great because at these conferences, it's so easy to get caught up in the numbers, the stats, the debates about vegetables. But at the end of the day, we're all individual people trying to improve our health. So even though I learned an absolutely insane amount of information, the thing that's really upped my motivation to level 1 million was hearing not only Casey's, but dozens of other success stories at the conference. The word is slowly but surely getting out about what we're actually supposed to be eating. And I'm determined to continue to fight to amplify the message. So that's my little report on KetoCon 2023. If you know anyone who might benefit from this information, please share it with them. Also, I'm proud to announce that my ADHD coaching program, Focused Fit Fun, is currently up and running and accepting new clients. If you are a woman with ADHD who is struggling to do all the things, then this is the solution for you. It's the only program of its kind that combines ADHD coaching with holistic health coaching and therapeutic grade dietary intervention to take you from frazzled to fabulous in just 13 weeks. And guess what? It's fun as fuck. Listen, you've probably been trying to do this whole life and health thing on your own for decades. Stop it. You deserve to give yourself the gift of support from someone who's walked through hell just like you and come out on the other side and not by listening to the usual BS advice. I can help you achieve the things you feel like giving up on. It's not too late, and it's easier than you think. You're not a fuck up, and your time is now. Check out the description for a link to more information. It would be my absolute honor to work with you. Thanks so much for listening, and have a happy and healthy day.